In the meantime, as I was saying, is that the military and the law enforcement are being set up to serve as cannon fodder in their war against who? Against us. And they can't wait for it to happen. And to talk about that is our next guest, because it is they, too, that are, that are subject of mind control. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for Russ Dizdar. Good to see everybody. Uh, greetings. I, um, I just say wow because right now, you know what, I feel like I'm being watched. And there's cameras on us and there's uh, speaking devices, you know, that are picking up everything. And you know what, after hearing everything so far and knowing what we know and what you're going to hear right now, I don't know whether you're going to like me after this session or not. But what I want to share with you is what we've experienced over the last 20-some years in a number of kind of fields. And... When I say this in the very beginning, um, it's, we're talking about the fins of the sharks in the water right now. What we're seeing right now and hearing all around us um, are the fins, but all of us know that, if, especially if you've been out to any of the, you know, the, the Atlantic coast, the Pacific, and I've been out there many times, and whenever they talk about sharks, I mean, I'm out of the water. If you ever know what it's like to feel a shark go right by your legs in the water, you want to get out of there. Even if you see the fin, you know what's, what it's attached to. And so a lot of the things we're talking about, uh, it's the fins that we are seeing and the ominous feeling, you know, da-dun, da-dun, you know, jaws. And so when you begin to think about all the different things, uh, chips and uh, listening and the government and all that's happening around us. See, I see chaos and I see a breakdown and I see collapse and I see, I see radical evil, you know, uh, injecting itself more than ever into the political and military and even in the spiritual realm where it all comes from from the beginning. And when I look at these things and I see the pictures of 9-11 you know how you describe America right now? America and the rest of the world is kind of like the people that were running. They were running from, you know, the, the collapsing building. They were concerned, you know. Remember the pictures where they're looking back and they had, you know, maybe smoke, you know, dust in their face and they're, they're terrified and they don't know what's going on, but they're looking back waiting for the collapse. And that is how I see, you know, this, this sea of uh, this ominous, you know, psychological, uh, you know, sense that is all across America right now. And it's that feeling that, that somewhere, somewhere along the line, the crash is coming. Something bigger than 9-11 will occur. That's biblically true, and I'm going to tell you from the, the threads of occultism, the New Age, and Satanism, and Luciferians, and the Masonic Order, all of those threads speak the same thing. Chaos before a new world order. And you and I sit back and we understand that, but, but I'm not sure. We're, we're looking at the fins underneath. God describes in the Word of God the nature of the shark and the intent of the shark. And, and how deadly it is. You, you and I can right now go back to Psalm chapter 2. And we can see from 3,000 years ago, a fulfillment's coming in Revelation 19, 19. 3,000 3, years ago, when God is, is, is speaking about the nations conspiring together, when it all comes down to it, they're conspiring together against who? There is something behind the curtains. Remember the Wizard of Oz and uh, the guy behind the curtains, you know, running all the stuff? I think we're looking at the big flaming head and we're looking at all of the stuff out there and we're seeing all these different uh, points of radical evil and crazy things and, and pain and suffering and everything else. But behind the scenes... Uh, this, this ancient dragon is uh, still hidden and still ominous and still, uh, you know, not being charged with the high crimes that one day he shall, um, he shall experience from the hand of the living God. So when I think in terms of the 3,000-year-old prophecy that's going to be fulfilled in Revelation 19.19 when the beast gathers who, the kings of the earth he gathers them together in all of their armies to do something. And that is to fight the descent of the Lamb of God, the rider on the white horse. 
When I look at prophecy and I look at the biblical descriptions of Satan all the way through, here's what I see that God has done for us. Not only give us the description of the nature of the beast, but the agenda of the beast. And looking at the biblical agenda of the beast, then I can peer in to Luciferian doctrines and look at the New Age movement and look at, look at what's happening around me and begin to say, like Peter on the day of Pentecost, when he referred to this is that which Joel spoke about, you and I can also say this is that which Isaiah spoke about or Psalm chapter 2 spoke about. It's an amazing thing what God has done in the area of prophecy. Depicting the end of the age and the conspiracy. And the conspiracy is the, the voice of an ancient hate that hates the throne of God. And that presence operates in, in spiritual threads around the world and entices political leaders as unwittings and even moves upon um, military and brings military application to all of this because if you read Revelation 19.19, you are going to see that it is the largest army in human history. It is, it is the new world order come together Gathered together, if you go back a few chapters, in chapter 16, Revelation 16, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, they, they are in ritual format releasing demons out of their mouth, targeting in spiritual warfare, we call it occult level warfare, in which they target the kings of the earth to move them to be gathered for the great day of God Almighty. And the agenda behind the scene is to... This whole new world order issue is not even just the politics and the military and everything else. It is about, it is about a battle that began in the heavenlies, Ezekiel 28, when the anointed cherub twisted in violence and turned on God and came to us and led us in our choice to rebel also. So we open the door to radical evil. And only because this great God who understands the beginning from the end and can give a prophecy that's 3,000 years old can also in the Old Testament give 300 prophecies referring to the redemption that's going to come in the Messiah the first time around. He'll be born in Bethlehem. Unto us the Son is given 700 years prior in Isaiah. And so God shows us what He's going to do in the redemption, the breaking in of the Basileia, the kingdom of God, into this fallen, fractured, broken, and collapsing world. You and I, we will not save this world. You and I and all the labor we put out may be able to pluck this and do this and do that and do all that we can do around us. But the, the, the salvation of the world is in the hands uh, of the one who died on the wooden cross. And you and I know that. You know His Spirit and His presence and His power. But I, I, I don't like to report to you, but over the years, I've listened to the demons and I've seen their presence and power. Hundreds of deliverances. I cannot even tell you how ugly so much of it has been. So before I go there, can I give you a little bit of hope? That Jesus Christ is indestructible, amen? That the Word of God is indestructible, amen? Listen, that the prophecies of God, that God has prophesied the second coming of Christ, indestructible, and Jesus said, I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The body of Christ is indestructible because of its divine you know, origins. The resurrection of Christ demonstrated the physics of God in the blasting apart of the finality of death. So the hope that you and I have is indestructible. It is incredible. It cannot fade. Nobody can steal it from you. And this is the message we proclaim to the world about a transformation in comparison to a transmutation that's been going on. Let me just go back to the, to the 80s for a few moments. In the 80s, when we were doing youth ministry and sharing with a lot of young people in schools all over, we began to see the threads of Satanism. We began to listen to young people saying how they were out sacrificing a rabbit or a cat or doing whatever else. We began to ask them, you know, and, and get involved with their lives, and we were seeing so much of it, we decided to form a little group, and we called it Shatter, Shatter the Darkness. And out of our team, just a number of us, we were going to target them for evangelism. We were going to learn more spiritual warfare. We got involved with young kids that were allowing things to come in their life. They were reading the ABCs of witchcraft, Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible. They were reading, you know, other books that were opening the doors. And they were opening the doors to presence in their life 
that led some of them to suicide, some of them to be in the psych ward, some of them to hate their parents. Sean Sellers, you know, after he took the protective pentagram off his chest, you know, he said he felt his chest expand. And then he went in and he shot his mother and he shot his stepfather. And then he said he laughed in satanic glee. He drank blood and wanted to, he wanted to follow Satan as far as he could from what he understood. One book said that, that in the 90s, it was the crime wave of the 90s, the satanic ritual abuse, satanic crimes. The fastest growing uh, subgroup in America in the 90s was, was the white middle class group going after Satanism. One of the fastest now is white middle class girls going after Wicca. And so the doors continue to be open you know, all over the place. And so as we begin to deal with deliverance issues and share with you know, people Jesus Christ and see the authority of Christ help them get rid of the voices in their heads and the presence that would throw them to the ground in our presence, we would see again that Christ raised from the dead, granting authority and power and transformation, can handle this transmutation. It was going on from the other side. But then I get a phone call. Because we invited a man to come up, Tom Wedge, to teach. Um, he a, wrote a book uh, called The Satan Hunter, a law enforcement book on uh, satanic crime. And law enforcement agencies during the 90s, they were training everybody in satanic crime all across the nation. So Tom took me to the police ca- academies, and he, let, he got me in, and we learned and listened and so forth, you know, at the police academies and... And we learned more and brought him in. And the more that occurred, the more calls we began to get. And I got a call one time right after coming back from Worthington, Ohio, the Opata. The very, the very same time, you know, uh, that I get back from another advanced field cult crime training thing, I get a call from a woman who's frantic. Uh, the, the stepdaughter's in the psych ward. Uh, she wants to kill herself. I drive down to the psych ward and uh, just a little 14-year-old girl you know, sitting across from me at a table, all she knows that's running through her head and she's writing it out on paper and she's drawing pictures is she must put gas on herself and burn her up in a ritual of the flames proving her love to her Satan-worshipping mother. As I ministered to her and led her to Christ in the psych ward of Children's Hospital in Akron, you know, and she got out, we began to do deliverance and sharing and then she got lost for a while. Now, many years later, personalities inside of her that were purposely created for coven use and uh, for transmitting secrets and, and, and keeping other personalities that were able to do rituals and do powers and leave the body began to surface inside of her life. There was demonization and personalities uh, that were built into her. And I watched again and again over time that how could anybody do this from the very beginning with little children? So when I talk about the, 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 the sense of the ramping up of radical evil, the ramping up, the shark is deadly. The teeth, you know, they are sharp in the destruction of humanity. Jesus said he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So we now, you know, begin to deal with multiple personality disorder. Somebody's personality that's not just one, but somewhere that's been split into two and three and four and five and six and 70 and 80 in substructures done in laboratories and done in other places. We began to deal one after another after another until we were flooded in the 90s. We tried to learn everything we could. Went off to Richmond, Virginia to hear Alan uh, Shefton and Corden Hammond at a, at a, at a, con- at a, at a conference like, just like this on the multiple personality disorder and satanic ritual abuse. Room was packed with psychiatrists and counselors and, and psychologists. And they were all dealing with this, this epidemic. Where are they all coming from? In the 70s, there was only a few. In the 80s, there were thousands. By the time the 90s came, there were millions. I called up Holly Hector at Centennial Hospital in Denver where they have a ritual abuse ward. She had already had written out in a manual, uh, people had quoted from her concerning the statistical um, diagnoses and so forth across the nation. In the early 90s, she, she had said that there is an estimated diagnosed level of 2.5 million multiple personality disorder with 87% being satanic ritual abuse. We, we come to discover, as we did more studies throughout the 90s, went to other conferences, dealing more and more with more multiples and more of them coming in. 
that on the one hand, the secular side didn't understand, other than the fact that there were separate, uh, definite personalities on the inside, but they didn't understand how it was all occurring. Was it just trauma? Did they just get raped? Uh, is, that, is that what has caused this? Until they begin to realize that inside of them, there were some pretty sharp personalities. You know, personalities that can be runners and personalities and informers and sex slaves and, and assassins and sleepers and suicides. And, and all of a sudden, they begin to discover programming. So that in a human personality, one person is up, but this person has been created and that person has been created and that and that and all the way down. And then we discovered that there's at least 4.5 million diagnosed cases. And now in the year 2007, over 5 million. What we've averaged out then was all of those that we've dealt with that were never in a psych ward counseling center or diagnosed anywhere. So in the 90s, we were saying there's got to be at least 10 million multiple personality disorder with satanic ritual abuse backgrounds, you know, out there in American society. Colin Ross, out of a Canadian psychiatrist out of Canada, wrote a book called Project Bluebird, The Purposeful Creation of Multiple Personality Disorder. And in this book, he estimates 10 million. Can you imagine 10 million? The question that haunts me is not just the victimization of feeling with individuals who've been raped and ever. I, I don't. Even, there's young people in this audience. I will not go into the depth of how they they cause the traumatic split. They are splitters. Then there are programmers. Then they bond. Then they conjure and put demonic presence on the programmed personality, and then they put them down with codes that they will later trigger for their own use. Be it sex slaves, be it drug runners, be it uh, those that uh, want to run reconnaissance, and those that they're infiltrating, you know, and putting in places, well, like in this room. You've got a few here in this room uh, among you. And so when you think in terms of the sheer numbers, the question I keep saying to pastors, to leaders, to counselors is, who in the world has done this? Dealing with them over again and again and again and again, the structure of them on the inside, listening to the personalities, engaging them, and hearing that they're, they're called chosen ones or BWBs or satanic super soldiers that they are very indoctrinated in the lower personalities in Luciferian doctrine, that, that doctrine of spiritual evolution to deification with the eradication of God. Something that Genesis 3 tells us that Lucifer did in the beginning, the Gnostics tried during the early church, the New Age spiritual thread is what? A spiritual evolution, star children and, and all, you know, all the rest. David Spangler and his belief that we're all, you know, got Lucifer in us and that there's a Luciferian uh, invocation that needs to be done to move us to that next stage of spiritual evolution in consciousness, moving us towards the, being God-men. The occultism of Alice Bailey and Aleister Crowley and the rest of them, the same kind of spiritual thread, spiritual ev evolution to the point of deification, becoming God with the exclusion or, of or eradicating God altogether. And then when you look at the traditional Satanists in America, thousands of them, in the latest book I read called The Devil's Bible by a Father Maradon from the Cathedral of the Black Goat in California, and, and reading through, seeing the same kinds of doctrines, the same belief in a hatred of Jehovah as they, as they term him, the hate God. And you should see the, it's, it's an upside down world. And what they believe and what they teach. But that same Luciferian doctrine, spiritual evolution to deification with the exclusion or advocation of God. And that's what so many of the chosen one have, have, have accepted within. They've been indoctrinated and programmed and told. I've sat for thousands of hours with them over 20 years. I've listened to the stories of the abuse, the sex, the rape, the, the altars, the ritual altars, the satanic stuff, the, the rituals. We've confiscated materials. We dealt with handlers. We, we, we formed a unit to track them, to hunt them down, to go after them, to find them, to expose them. We've learned how to do spiritual warfare targeted right back to deal with them. And they don't like it. They don't like it. 
The issue that we have today is the fact with, with Bob Rosio, a good friend that wrote the book called um, Hitler in the New Age. We are on a reap trip into Pennsylvania, northern Pennsylvania, with one of these chosen ones from Fort Bragg. Spoke five languages, specifically German, on the inside. Knew all kinds of ritual powers and everything else could remote view and do all kinds of things. They'd been with Michael Aquino. They'd been with Colonel Shannon and his Earth Battalion Light Force at the PSYOPs operations in Fort Bragg. And we met more like them later on down the road. So we're in Pennsylvania digging up bones at a site that she's taking us to that we don't know if we're going to get attacked or whatever else. We dig up the bones, you know, and we're putting on praise music in the middle of this, this forest. Other law enforcement or former law enforcement men were with me, and we, we get all this stuff gathered. And I buy this book in Pennsylvania at this bookstore because I love books. And I was reading the book, and uh, his, his constant phrase was, deception always leads to destruction. That's true concerning the anointed cherub that, that violently twisted and changed his genetics forever. That's true of the human race and the belief in the, in the lie and the rejection of the truth. That deception leads to destruction. Sin is deception. It leads to destruction. The spiritual waves that we see going on in our culture today, it's part of the agenda from the other side. Now, reading Bob Rosio's book, and he gives this whole explanation of, you know, before the rise of Nazi Germany, that, uh, that there was all kinds of spiritual groups that developed, and they helped forge the Thule Society and the secret societies that eventually demonic uh, inspiration brought about demonized ideology. And that demonized ideology had military application. And that deception ultimately led to millions and millions along with a clear revelation of that spiritual side's hatred of all of Israel and the goal of annihilation. Satan knows prophecy. Read Revelation chapter 12 sometime when the dragon stood before Israel waiting for the Christ child to be born that he might devour it. And the indestructible Christ ran circles around the dragon as he always does. And then, if he couldn't destroy Christ, he'd go after Israel. And if he can't destroy Israel, he'll go after the body of Christ. And I'm here to tell you today, not only is Christ indestructible, Israel indestructible because of its divine origins, not because of its own righteousness. The church indestructible because of the origins of the indestructible Christ. And they keep hammering away and hammering away. What I have found is that Luciferians believe in what they're doing. They believe they're going to outrun Christ. They're going to outrun it all. But if you don't understand the ultimate agenda, Revelation 19.19, to have a unified political world that has demonized politics and, and demonized military and taking a hold of the mark, which involves spiritual acquisition... How can, how, can, how can this beast bring the world together, bring the kings of the earth, bring educated Europe together only to fight the descent of the Lamb of God? Deception leads to destruction. In another book written by an occultist, an occult historian called The Occult Establishment, he said in history there are two great proliferations of occult literature, or in the last hundred years at least, of, of uh, the great proliferation of occultic literature. You're all buying literature that, that feeds you, that lends to your belief systems. He said in two times in history, great sums of literature was poured out into cultures. The first was in pre-Nazi Germany with masses of materials that was unleashed, practices, and, and, and Rudolf Steiner, and you can look at all the rest of them and study the whole occult history in the background. Because it wasn't just flesh and blood. It wasn't just the physical... It was, it, was a, it was a demonized political ideology that fueled the beliefs and systems of Himmler that would have Würzburg Castle and, and the Hall of the Dead in which some of our own military will go and do rituals in to conjure the same spirits, the same ancient spirits that, that guided uh, Helena Blodowiecki in, in the secret doctrine and the histories of the human race, which included the Aryans. 
They were after Aryan blood. Pure blood. Blood that would transmute humanity and make humanity God-men. Luciferian doctrine, evolution to deification. They were believing in that same principle. And in that principle, that's what drove them to be mad and the slaughter and the murder and the bloodshed and the fulfilling of the satanic plan. Second greatest proliferation of occult literature in all of history is in the United States in the 60s, where all this material began to come over, including the rise of the satanic church, the satanic Bible, and all the literature from the East. Oz Guinness, in the book Dust of Death, he describes, you know, what happened to the West kind of like a, a safari in a jungle where they go way off into the jungle and during the night you build these great big fires and great fires are burning and everybody's there and safe. But you recognize that during the night when the fires begin to rescind and go down, he said what happens on the safari is that all in the woods all around you, you begin to see eyes. He called it the, the encircling eyes, getting closer and closer and closer where the fires are going you know, further down. He described it in the West as the fires of Christendom begin to wane. The encircling eyes, you know, they, they are coming in for their feeding. And they have fed off of our people in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And not just the Woodstock generation, not just the, the culture clash, not just, you know, the generations that didn't know what they needed to do with their lives. Baby boomers and baby bleeders and baby killers. All of it was there. It's somewhere under the table of this satanic ritual of peace. Father Shefton estimated 100,000 covens in the United States, 65 million New Agers in the United States, 50,000 50, uh, Masonic temples in the United States. We are littered with doorways to those ancient spirits that were back there in the days of Manasseh. 2 Kings 2021 20, in Jerusalem. They, they have no shame. If they can get an inch, they want it all. They want it all of Jerusalem. They wanted the temple. And Manasseh even sacrificed his own son. That's how, that's how far radical, you know, radical evil can lead in its deception to destruction. And so we have stories of hundreds of thousands of individuals, some sitting in this room, that will tell you of enormous and crazy rituals and satanic things and programming and electrodes on their heads and lights and drugs and sounds. They know what it is to be triggered. <laughs> Tell you what it is to be triggered. They took me up to meet this lady. She was a federal officer's wife. And when I met the lady, this federal officer's wife, she looked so pitiful and so, so in need. We began to help her. She all of a sudden began to display other personalities in her life and demonization. She was part of an underground group. She also could speak fluent German, one of the personalities on the inside, like all of them. And as we dealt with her more and more and more, one time we got called to go to Cleveland. The federal officer's there. Other people are in the house. People have weapons. The coven is calling to trigger this person to, that a runner would pop up and take the body out of there to the coven meeting. And they had to physically restrain her from going until finally she stood up, looked at me and said, I want to talk to you in the other room. And so we went off to the other room. And as I'm looking at this little lady in her pitiful face, she switches. And it's Iris. And it's this cult loyal priestess. That with all of her, the intensity of hate and everything, she's there. She has her hands over a sash on her waist. And she's getting closer and closer to me. And just about the time she got about two feet away, the Lord said, she's going to stab you. And just that quickly, she pulled out this large needle and, and tried to jam it into my chest. And because of the Lord's presence and help, we just pushed her back. The husband came running in. She manifested demonically in front of him. We went through this entire procedure of deliverance. The demonic presence was broken. The federal officer sat there just weeping and crying. He could not handle it. He ended up divorcing the woman. And she is out there. 
Another woman that comes in from Fort Bragg, you know, and shows CIA stuff and shows all the backgrounds of Monarch and the little purple butterfly on her left ankle and describing how it is that they split the human core and the raw human material that they begin to bond to and have it bond to them so that they can be the ones that created it and make this emotional bond so that they can begin to tell it what to be and tell it what to do and program it and show it screen memories and put loop tape on and not just what, what the what Cameron did in, in Canada as far as depatterning, they, they had raw personality, as they call it, to program and to make it anything they want. In this person, she had personalities that could speak five separate languages, including German. One day I'm sitting in the front of the car. She's in the back. We're waiting for another pastor to come into the car. And a German, Kurt, comes up. And he says, here, and he gives me a tape, and he says, put this in. Sounds like it had been recorded off some old 33 record. It was Nazi propaganda music. And then they pulled out German cigarettes. And so here's a girl from Fort Bragg, a military person, knows weapons very well and everything else, now with a male German personality with an accent speaking to me. Same individual one night, we're going to check out a ritual site and they're taking us to a certain location and I have piggybackers behind me. We, we had to learn what to do along the way so that we would not get set up, you know, and, and, and everything else happened to us. I didn't want to end up in the pot somewhere where people are, you know, singing that song, toil, toil, whatever that is. She asked me to pull over. I pulled over. We're sitting there. It's raining outside. And the next thing I know, she reaches down into a bag and she pulls out a 9 millimeter. But when she looked at me, I knew the eyes had shifted. She, it was no longer her. And they began to talk about the weapon. And they said, do you want to see my weapon? And I said, sure. And they handed me the weapon. And I took a look at the weapon. I pulled it back. It was chambered. And I didn't know whether or not to give it back or not. When I praying internally, you know, and asking the Lord, and so was I'm talking and, and looking at it, I said, well, tell me your name. My name is Assassin. <laughs> what do you do was a stupid question, wasn't it? And he described what their job was all about. They described in their programming, I can tell that they had no concept, only to do a job. Now, this has happened again and again and again and again and again with other multiples. We've learned how to break demonic structure and demonic presence and seals and so forth and find sleeper personalities deep down within and be able to bring them up and begin to engage them. We learned how to see Jesus come in and bring inner healing to that transmuted, broken personality after deliverance would, it be, you know, would occur because you're dealing with the human will. You're dealing with the, the core of what a human being is all about. And you've got to keep asking yourself, where did 4 million, 5 million, 10 million of them come from? Why are they here? Why are they in the military? Why are they in the government? Why are they placed in churches all over the place? Why are they places? You know what we learned along the way when we interacted with, God, with, with, with the Brotherhood and other Luciferians? We learned from the materials we confiscated and the things that we got and the discussions that we had with cult loyal priestesses, with people inside that were able to speak ancient languages, conjuring demons. One individual sitting in my car and, and I knew something was up. I could feel it inside and, I, and, 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 and I'm beginning to pray on the inside and I'm like, Lord, I, oh, I know this, there's going to be a problem here tonight. And uh, so inwardly I'm praying, anything in, G, you know, in the name of Jesus, if there's any demonic stuff here, I'm commanding you, you know. And I, and I started praying against it. And out of her mouth, a different voice says, blankety blank, cut that out. You, you can fill in the blanks. And so inwardly, what did I do? I prayed all the more. Out of the mouth comes this thing again, blankety blank, cut it out. So I pulled off the road. And I began to pray outwardly. And they not like a regular demonized individual. They begin to pray outwardly in this kind of chant, this kind of strange thing. I've never heard it before. And they're using the name Ar Aramane and calling on demons to come and aid them. And so I'm praying louder in the name of Jesus. And they're praying louder. And I got louder and they got louder. And then all of a sudden they grabbed their head, opened the door, threw up, and ran. They have been trained to be satanic super soldiers. They understand spiritual warfare. 
the same individual talked about a grid map over all of Northeast Ohio in which every single church is on their grid map, like a military grid map, and they're all color-coded, and the ones that they think will give them trouble is the ones that they need to go and infiltrate and deal with, and from their covens do warfare against blitzkrieg, lightning warfare, they called it. So when you think in terms of uh, what's happening around us right now, we found them in, in the military, we found them in, in government, we found them all, in all kinds of places. Churches everywhere, they're trained to be infiltrators, they're trained to be sabotages inside churches, they're trained to get to the pastor, to the leaders, they're trained to bring, you know, uh, you know, to allow the inside personalities to share all the pain while the other inside personalities are doing cult level warfare against, you know, pastors and leaders. They're bringing demonized objects into the church and giving them as gifts. And they're trying to see and test their powers against the power of the church and of the body of Christ. And I've been to church after church after church again and again and again, seeing the destruction because they're working so covertly and they're so highly trained. And there are hundreds of thousands of them in churches everywhere. In buildings and places, and we found out along the way that they have this Luciferian belief in a chaos before this new satanic age. They believe in a coming fura that will lead them. They're, 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 they're blood oath committed. One of them said to me one time, We will make Hitler's SS troops look like choir boys. Whenever I see them switch and turn, oh, I can tell you again, sitting in my office, a military sergeant brings in his wife. She's got multiple personality disorder. So what do I do? You know, I, I sit down across and I begin to do the first, you know, interview and begin to discuss and so forth. And as I'm praying, I just went down to write a few notes and all of a sudden, past my head, I felt a presence go down, slam into the desk. I look up. Her eyes are all glazed. She's got this... That, that, that hate in her eyes and face and this defiance against me. And it's a military bayonet that went right past my hair. She pulled up the bayonet again and went after me again a second time and lodged it into the desk. By that time, the military sergeant opens up the door and says, What's going on? He was sitting right outside. And she growled at him and ran towards him. He slammed the door and she put the knife all the way through the door. And then the Akron police came and they just took her to the psych ward. And I can tell you story after story like that. That when you dig down and get down inside and find out what's really going on, we are seeing what they're saying, that they are the troops of Antichrist. Who's going to bring him to power? Who's going to be serving him worldwide? Who's going to be there to do the persecutions against the church? Well, they, they inside, programmed and demonized wise, believe they are. And so all among, you know, American society right now in Canada and UK and throughout Europe, something has been going on. Yeah, it goes way back. It goes all the way back to the Nazis and Mingala and the splitting. And it, it goes back to the scientists and the occult ideology. It goes back to the dream of a, of a 1,000 year reign uh, with godmen like, like the Aryans, maybe like Nephilim blood. And to bring it all together, and, and we, see, we see that our OSS, you know, our OSS the, the, before the, the CIA, you know, we see that they are blinded by the spiritual agenda. That they just take it right on in. Without the Spirit of Christ, without the aid of God, without the aid of the Word of God, you cannot pierce this incredible, satanic, operative secrecy that is going on around us. And we see the fins, we're describing the fins, but the shark... It's ready to pounce. They call it the Black Awakening. They call it the Black Awakening. Opposite of a spiritual awakening, in, in the great evangelical awakenings, hundreds of thousands in England and others, through Wesley's and others, turned to Christ. They see it as opposite of what happened with Pete or Philip in Samaria in the book of Acts chapter 8 when he rushes in with the kingdom of God and he preaches Christ and those who are following Simon and the great power and, and under that spell that was broken and people got saved and they got healed and they got delivered and the city was full of joy because the impact of the kingdom of God can be culture-wide as it expels satanic presence, infuses lives and society with truth. 
So they call it the Black Awakening, a day in which they're looking, they're licking their chops. I'm just telling you as I see it. I'm just telling you as I, as I, you know, have experienced over these years to see this bloodthirsty. Listen, I have listened to the demons scream at me. I have listened to them cuss me out and curse me. I've seen them manifest in human lives, young people and others, in multiples and so forth for so many times. I'm, so, I'm sick of the demons. I'd far rather lead somebody to Christ, but it's necessary because biblical prophecy speaks of a massive ramping up unparalleled in history prior to the apocalypse of Antichrist and then during that age. Babylon of the old days is nothing in comparison with the coming Babylon. The deception that leads to destruction is, is horrific. So when you think in terms of, you know, a million, two million, intact, sleepers, Luciferian, cult-created, brotherhood, whatever you want to call them, BWBs, Babylon working babies. Whenever you think of these, you think in terms of, you know, the, the guy that, that opened fire in, in a Baptist church in Texas, Columbine and VTech. I don't know the profile of the young man. I got sent a lot of things. Yes, it looked like he was disturbed and looked like he was emotional, but his proficiency in assassination, his 60% kill rate, and his ability to blow his own face off speaks to me of assassin programming. And so if you think that VTech and Columbine and other places like that were horrific, they say these to them, they even they contact me. They contact me and ask me what I think about their agenda. What I think. They constantly antagonize me. But it's okay. They're on the open field. And I get to witness and share. And, and maybe some of them will be like Saul of Tarshish. And God will just, you know, that's how we pray. But the black awakening that you and I, you know, have been maybe hearing about, maybe some of you are hearing it the first time, is what numerous... Um, multiples from the inside, not the upper or level personalities, but the inside, cult loyal, Luciferian trained, very, very able personalities know. It's what the demons have screamed and, and yelled. The demons know a few things. Can I tell you what they know? They don't care about Muhammad. They don't care about Buddha. They don't care about Quetzalcoatl. They don't care about the New Age. They fear Christ. They fear Jesus Christ. And they know of a coming judgment. And they know of a place called the abyss. And they can't stand quoting the Word of God to them. And when the authority of Christ bears on them and the orders are given, get out, eck out, as Jesus would say, they're gone. And it's an incredible decimating power of the indestructible Christ and the authority that's been given to every single Christian to bear you know, that spiritual authority trampling on snakes and scorpions, overcoming all of the dunamis, the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. This is what they say the Black Awakening is all about. Four things real quick. Number one, chaos. It's all about chaos. But in their terms, chaos, bloodshed, means ritual blood. Doorways open for the demons to flow in. So VTech occurring at 50,000 places in the United States in one you know, week, that's going to be a different story. You will not miss the Black Awakening. This chaos before the apocalypse, spoken about, I believe, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Greek word apostasia, listen, take a look in five or six Greek dictionaries, you're going to see the root word goes back to the turning over of policies, the great revolt of uh, one regime uh, throwing out another and taking over. This is used in Acts 21.21 in the Old Testament when Moses came down and the people have turned everything over and went back to the worship of the calf. A great revolt and then the apocalypse. Even the Islamic imams tell us the same things. That the Mahdi cannot come to power until great bloodshed. Great bloodshed. Which in my understanding of ritual format means the drawing of powers. Releasing of powers. The infusion of demonic presence everywhere in this black awakening. Chaos, secondly. Collapsing society. We've been through the frog and the kettle approach of spiritual confusion long enough. But this is, this is the pounce. This is, this, is, this, is the, this is the explosion. This is the 9-11 in 50,000 places at once. 
to collapse American society, and they believe it needs to be collapsed. They believe it needs to be brought down, UK, everywhere, so that, listen, in the collapsing of society as we know it during the Black Awakening, there's an agenda of elimination targeting pastors, political leaders, military people, anybody they perceive ahead of time is going to be opposing their agenda and the agenda of a new world order which will never come to, to power without the man of sin. The apocalypse, the unveiling, 2 Thessalonians 2. They then believe that in this elimination, as they are targeting, let me tell you something about the target, targeting. We, we have found targeters. We, 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 we've tracked them. And, and I don't even have time because we're over right now, but I'm just letting you know right now of what their real agenda is, the real Luciferian agenda to bring the collapse, to destroy society, to bring in the Luciferian power. Go back to Revelation 19:19, 19, 19, and you're going to still see that the Lamb will run circles around the dragon, crushing him, bringing in the kingdom of God. Whoa. <laughs> Holy mackerel. We all know it's going to happen. But when it's put, put, you know, put out there for you like that, you still. You know. Yeah, it's going to be pretty ugly. So we all know what sign of, side of the line we're going to be standing on, don't we? Like I said, we may lose a battle, but we're going to win the war.